Hi, I'm Fraser Hogan. I'm the Chief Executive at Alcohol and Drugs Action, based in Haddon Street in Aberdeen. Hi, Fraser. Um, can you give us an overview of what the key issues are in Aberdeen in relation to alcohol and drug use? Well, like a lot of urban areas uh, in Scotland at the moment, one of the, the key things that we're, we're, we're seeing, and sadly, is a, a rise in the number of drug-related deaths. And in terms of alcohol, we already know that um, the alcohol sales in Scotland outstrip um, the rest of the UK, uh, and we very much have issues around alcohol too. Um, I think Aberdeen, um, I can't necessarily speak for other areas, but certainly we do know in Aberdeen that there's quite, still quite a number of people who are um, basically not in touch with services, so maybe not getting support. So. We, we, we all see people who um, are in crisis and they're maybe connected to different types of services, but equally there are still numbers of people out there who are struggling with either alcohol and drug issues and they are not in touch with services. So that's something that we know um, is really quite um, crucial, really. We're also seeing a, a sort of fragmentation in terms of drug use. So the traditional patterns of, of drug use have been a bit disrupted, and, and not really just because of COVID, but prior to COVID too. So what we're seeing now in terms of some of the more chronic uses of drugs is what, drugs is what we call poly drug use. So this would be individuals who are using a wide range of illicit substances, uh, sometimes medication mixed in there, probably taken inappropriately in some, in some cases, but not always, and alcohol too being used as, as part of that, that kind of concoction of, of substances. And we're also seeing people who would traditionally be alcohol users, but be sometimes using drugs and, and vice versa too. Um, but one of the biggest issues, I guess, right now across Scotland and, and again in Aberdeen in the northeast, uh, is the use of benzodiazepines. So this is substances like Valium, uh, so these are kind of tranquilizer type 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 drugs. They're, they're traditionally medications, but what we're seeing is a an increase in illicitly made um, benzodiazepines, which are very very easy to to, to come across. Uh, all over the country and in Aberdeen is no, no different, they're very cheap. Unfortunately, um, we don't often know the ingredients that are in there. We don't know the quality of the, the substance and therefore we don't know how strong it is and therefore people can be caught out when they're taking these, these tablets. And sometimes they have a, a, a bit of time before they maybe kick in and people think they're maybe not getting the effect and maybe take too much. So all of these things obviously relate to, to why we have such a high um, number of drug related deaths because people are often taking these tablets in conjunction with alcohol, opiate drugs like heroin and other medications, opiate type based medications such as uh, methadone and things like that. Um, and obviously at this time with COVID as well, we're, we're, we are aware of this as a number of people that are not in the normal way in touch with services too um, because obviously um, they're probably being a little bit unseen. The state home message obviously is, is, is being adhered to by, by, by a lot of uh, people across the across the, the, the city, but obviously that makes it slightly difficult for us to see people. So sometimes that crisis that's happening can be unseen in that way where normally sometimes people would present at our front door and they can't quite do that at the moment. So um, we, we're not quite sure what's happening out there right now and obviously once restrictions lift we'll, we'll see a, a different kind of picture. So what does this mean for Aberdeen City and its priorities? Well I think the, the city, um, we, obviously one of the key focuses is how do we um, reach and how do we engage um, people, particularly those people who are not in any kind of support. So you don't know what you don't know, so how, how, how best do we try and do that? But equally for those people who, who are in touch with services or, or different services across the city who are in crisis, how do we react quickly in terms of trying to, to support them before things could potentially get out of hand and, and get serious for individuals? So those are the those are the kind of priorities. So very much around still working around prevention and early intervention easy access into support and treatment, whether that means um, uh, medical treatment as well, detoxification, uh, other other things that are going on. We need to try and find ways, innovative ways to try and uh, get people engaged and, and get them into treatment, because we know that's one of the things that keeps people safe overall. So following on from this, how does this involve priority localities and their community members within Aberdeen? 
Well, across the city, the, 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 the communities and, and wider services, so moving away from thinking about just alcohol and drug specific uh, specialist type services, uh, we need professional staff, community members and the wider public to be aware um, and, or have a level of awareness around alcohol and drug issues, particularly for knowing what to do to help people, to signpost people at the very least into that support treatment, but being able to kind of spot that. It's not an unreasonable request in some ways because alcohol and drug use doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's often alcohol and drug use is really just the tip of the iceberg. It's the, the reason why, you know, it maybe masks some other problems, in other words. So people have got other issues going on. Alcohol and drugs sit on top, and it's the most visible thing, but there could be a number of underlying issues in terms of mental well-being, in terms of trauma, in terms of people's social circumstances, or the, 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 the environment, uh, the relationships. So there's lots of opportunities to um, uh, you know, reach people when they're in other forms of crisis, but alcohol and drugs is obviously making things worse. So being able to, to do that and at the same time being able to um, try and tackle stigma, because that's the other reason we know that a lot of people don't come forward and we have this sort of hidden population is because there's an awful lot of stigma around uh, having uh, you know, problems with alcohol and drugs. I don't like saying that, that people are problematic themselves. I think it's the issues that they have that are problematic. So, uh, and that's part of the stigma that we need to try and tackle as well. And what does the evidence tell us in relation to what works and what doesn't work when tackling issues around alcohol and drugs? Well, there's, uh, it's, there's some mixed evidence really. I guess, I guess in some ways, things like um, education programmes, you know, kind of school age things, prevention type work is very hard to measure. Um, there's often um, not a lot of evidence that that is very robust around education and prevention type type work. But what we do know is that raising awareness and building resilience in young people and those who are in the early stages of maybe experiment with alcohol and drugs and or drugs is absolutely critical. So providing support, basically anything that, 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 that tackles um, um, their living circumstances and their choices and things. It's, probably, it's not actually about the drugs or the alcohol, it's about everything else almost at that, that early stage. Um, the other thing as well is about trying to um, tackle the issues, as I mentioned before, that, that, that surround um, the person. So, we do know that if you are looking at someone's alcohol and drug use, but they are they're having problems with the housing, you need you need to do both. You can't you can't sort of leave one to tackle the other. So there's lots of opportunities and lots of good evidence that if you look at someone's mental health, if you're looking at their, their housing situation, their financial situation, um, if you can help their family situation, all of these things um, will help enable that person to get the support that they need and to be able to probably deal with some of the alcohol and drug issues because often they are just sitting there as a result of other things that are, that are happening to that person. So what we do know is getting people into um, support treatment quickly is, is definitely something that, that helps. And the longer we can keep someone in support, i.e. they get all the benefits from that support and the better the outcomes uh, as well. Um, another one is partnership working. We know that um, alcohol and drugs is a cross-cutting issue. It's very, very complex. So the more uh, effective the partnership working is, the, the, the best. And again, those outcomes, so a range of professionals or different community uh, groups, projects working together often has a far bigger net effect than trying to do any work in isolation. As useful as that sometimes might be, it's certainly the, the results are always better when working, when working together. And again, tackling stigma um, and making sure that people listen to, and that I guess we're 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 dealing with people appropriately. We're aware of and we're sensitive to uh, some of those issues that they might have. That, that it's a big step for someone to go and get support for for one for an issue like this. And obviously, the the, the type of welcome that person gets when they come through the door or they first make contact with any service is really really critical. And again, might actually determine how successful the the outcome might be. And in another way, again, that partnership working part of, of, of wrapping around services, so trying to do as many different things or tackle together some of the issues that someone may be encountering, trying to do that in a joined up way at the same time. It avoids people then having to be assessed and reassessed by different agencies and, and different professionals 
which again can be very off-putting. Trying to tell your story to five or six different people when maybe telling it to one person um, makes things a lot more effective and a lot more kind of joined up. And I guess finally that people do um, do recover. So we do know that people who um, might be in complete crisis at this moment in time in the future, there are opportunities that they can move away from that crisis, they can move into what we call recovery or start that recovery journey. And it's, it's basically every intervention that we do is that first small step on that recovery journey, no matter how difficult it may be or how far away that might feel from um, some kind of sobriety or, or normality for that person. It's just a small step that's important to recognise. And obviously the use of um, people who, who themselves have lived experience who are now in recovery helping others is obviously another um, really helpful thing that there's a lot of good evidence that that helps people to kind of move on in their own journey when they realise that they're not alone. So there's quite a number of things that, 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 can, be, that can be looked at as being uh, as having quite good um, efficacy in terms of helping people. So from your perspective, what makes a good application in this area of work? Well, a good application um, would be putting into, into practice some of those principles that I've just mentioned there. So any of those um, points that can be made practical and put into kind of daily practice would be really, really good. Um, again, a good application of clearly marked outcomes. So knowing what you want to do is, is important, but equally how are you going to achieve it and equally how are you going to measure it. So I'm aware obviously small projects won't be um, involved in elaborate evaluation processes, but obviously it's the simple things like learning to keep good records and being able to, to bring up information of what you've done and what you've achieved keeping those records are absolutely key as well and being able to see at the application stage how are you going to do that you've thought about these things is obviously important equally again knowing your limitations so you, you might know what you want to do or, or what your what project's going to try to achieve but there's obviously things that you can't do and being able to know those limitations is, is, is helpful and being able to cost things out realistically so what is your what is your activity in terms of not just the cost but the resourcing as well, how much time will, 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 will different things take? What's the, um, the kind of rationale behind some of that? Has that been thought out? And equally, um, trying new things. So looking for, th for projects or ideas or bits of work that are quite innovative and trying something different. So in some ways, there might not be any evidence base for some of those activities, but that's, that's how we learn. That's how we find things out. So sometimes finding something that's going to try and do things a little bit differently there's never a guarantee of success with that obviously but there's always a guarantee of learning one, one way or the other of what what does and what doesn't work so i think that's uh, something that's usually quite helpful as well so being alive to um, new ways of working and um, what advice in terms of the screening of applications can you give to the panel members um, obviously, the first thing would be to be as objective as possible, um, to try and stick as carefully and faithfully to the criteria uh, that you're given. That's really, really important. Um, and obviously, to look at the, um, the expectations of any application and make sure that it's clear, because you need to know that, that you need to understand the values of that application. Um, it's all often useful as well to see if other people have been consulted in the process of how that application has been constructed. So has that involved other partners? Has that involved anyone from within that target group or audience or the local community or people with lived experience? Have they been asked what they think? Um, and I think as well as scanning the horizon to look at the gaps, we all know that there's gaps in provision and gaps in service, but equally looking sideways to see well, who else is already around you that could help, who else, who else is around you that could maybe partner up and provide some of the things maybe you can't do. So a small project working with other projects can suddenly gain a lot more traction because of that, that kind of partnership working. So I think that's often very important. And I think lastly, I would say it would be to ask questions. Don't be afraid to, to ask if you're not sure. Thank you, Fraser. That's been really insightful. Is there any final comments or feedback you'd like to say to the panel members? Just again, just good luck and um, be inquisitive. Ask those questions.